I'd love to take questions to find out what you'd like to know. So you really showed tremendous compassion and vulnerability in this movie and shared intimate parts of your life that for me are unimaginable that I could ever do something like that. How, how did you evolve as a person and when did you finally have the courage to sort of let all of that information come out? Well, it was... <laughs> That was an interesting uh, process, interesting journey, because uh, in 1993, uh, I was doing a play in New York, Jeffrey. Uh, and so I played the role of Darius. And so every night, night after night, I played this character who is out and proud, and on TV, uh, he was a coarse boy in Cats, lived in a penthouse, didn't pay rent, um, dumb, huh? Um, so it was, I was able to uh, live out through this character some of my fantasies. And so through that process, I reached out to a friend of mine, um, uh, Robbie Brown, and I said, I'd really like to write a book. And so he's, he introduced me to Eric Marcus, and we uh, sat and talked for a while. Um, actually, the first book he just finished was the Bob and Rod Paris Jackson book. And I was like, I couldn't get through the first chapter. You know, I said, you're going to have to do better than this. Okay? <laughs> so um, so then, then he sent me uh, Making History, um, The Struggle for uh, uh, LGBT Human Rights. And, um, and that's what really sold me, that I really wanted him to be my co-author and we'd work together. And so I felt at that moment in time that I was sharing all of my weaknesses. You know, it's not real masculine to admit that you were raped. Um, I was an Olympic athlete, you know. That doesn't happen to Olympi uh, Olympic athletes, right? Um, I was in an abusive relationship. Um, I stayed in that relationship for six years after that you know, believing that I, I deserved it. And um, so also uh, sharing my sexual identity, finally coming forward with that, sharing my HIV status. Um, and what was amazing was uh, once the book was published in 95, uh, little did I know, Random House made uh, Eric sign a contract that he would have the, the book done within one year because Random House was afraid that I was going to die. And so, showed them, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so uh, when we went, went on book tour, it was so amazing. And that's when I realized by, by sharing my perceived weaknesses, I was actually sharing my strength. Uh, because people were coming up to me and saying, you saved my life. Um, I had so many instances where, uh, you know, people shared their stories with me. And I know that I'm the only person that they shared those stories with at that moment in time. Uh, I remember being in Atlanta, and, uh, you know, people forget, I mean, I, I, Reverend Fred Phelps followed me around the country. So, I mean, it was so funny, because, like, uh, my, uh, my, one, one of the first speaking engagements after the publishing of the book was in Lawrence, Kansas, and so it was right in his backyard, right? Um, so I'm there, uh, and he's standing outside across the street uh, with his signs, you know, die AIDS faggot, and you'll burn in hell, and pictures of me with 666 on my forehead, and um, all this stuff. 
uh, and it was so cute because the guy, the, the people who were putting on the, um, uh, the event, they wanted to protect me from that. I said, no, I want to see it, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, they brought me to this window and I peered out and I, and I saw that and um, I said, oh, that's so cool, you know? And, uh, and of, of course, when I get there, because when there's ever there's any controversy, you know, it is standing room only. So, I mean, the people came out in droves. And so, during the Q&A, one of the audience members says, well, Mr. Luganus, what do you think of the ignorance that's standing outside this building? And I said, oh, you mean Fred? <laughs> and they kind of chuckled, and, and I said, you know what, I feel like I should hand him a teddy bear and tell him he needs lots of hugs, because anybody who spews that much hate can't like themselves very much. And so the LGBT student union sent him a bunch of teddy bears in my honor, <laughs> telling him he needs lots of hugs, which I thought was so cool. I thought was so cool. And, um, and then another event, I was speaking in Florida, and I had this young gentleman, My Michael, um, said, you know, well, what, what do you do uh, about the hate you know, be about you know being uh, LGBT, and uh, I thought it was done. So I was going to tell him the story about Reverend F Phelps, but he said he continued. He said even when it comes from your own family, and that just stunned me. I just couldn't imagine. Um, and I said, first off, come here, <laughs> and I went. I got down off the podium and gave him a hug. And, you know, I, I told him, I said, you know, you have to know that you're a good person. You know, you have to have, you know, faith in that, you know, and believe in yourself that you're a good person. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I've had the good fortune to, to live longer than I thought I was going to live, um, but, but also have some pretty amazing experiences through this process. Uh, I, I wasn't inducted into the San Diego, since I grew up in San Diego, um, I wasn't inducted into the San Diego Hall of Fame uh, for, initially for reasons of homophobia, and then, um, and then I, you know, and then I, I would usually do that for my mom so that she could get all dressed up because she loved that, you know, and she was, uh, she was so proud. Um, and so I enjoyed doing that for her, you know, not so much for myself. And she had pa she passed in 04. And, uh, and so uh, I was competing in dog agility at the time. And this, this guy said, well, why aren't you in the San Diego Breitbart Hall of Fame? I said, well, you know, I, I just did that for my mom, and she's no longer here. And my cousin read that uh, article, and so at my mom's memorial, we gave out these roses. Uh, I, I got these gold roses um, that were, uh, had red enamel, um, because my mother loved roses. And uh, so she sent that to me. And she said, I will, I will stand in for your mom because I want you to be inducted into the San Diego Hall of Fame. And, you know, that day I had no idea what I was going to say. I had no clue. And it was amazing, I mean, how the universe works. Um, that morning I got uh, an email. Uh, well, actually it was a Facebook message. Um, from this young boy, and he said, you're not going to remember this, but 15 years ago, you came to Salem, Oregon for your book signing, and I was the first one in line, and you signed all of my pictures, and I even had a picture of you and your deaf uh, Harlequin Great Dane, um, Ryan Luke, and so you signed Believe in Yourself, what you usually sign, and you also signed your name, and then you signed for Ryan Luke, and you drew a paw print. And he said, in that moment in time, I decided 
that I was not going to end my life that night. Uh, and so, you know, I've had the good fortune to, you know, to have these experiences because you never know what kind of impact you're going to have. You know, just a simple, you know, little act of kindness or giving somebody a little extra time. Um, you know, you, you never know what kind of impact that's going to have. Um, I have another story about, uh, they were concerned about my safety on my book tour. So a lot of times I, you know, I had a, I hate to say bodyguard, but um, security. Uh, and uh, when I was in, in Atlanta, um, I, there, was a, there was an officer um, and she was like this Amazon woman. Beautiful a Amazon woman, um, and um, uh, you know, and she said, uh, "Mr. Leganis, can I have a word with you?" And so she pulled me to the side and she handed me a bullet. And she said, "The significance of me handing you this bullet is you have done so much for me, and that I would take a bullet for you." And that was so unbelievable. You know, and I still have that bullet. I mean, it's in my um, my jewelry box, and I open it up, and it's right there. So, yeah, it's amazing. Interview with Larry King now. What would you say to him? If if I could, I'm I'm sorry. If I could, if you could redo that interview with Larry King. If I could redo that uh, interview. Well, you're intelligent. Why didn't you practice safe sex? Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know, and it, it, it's really interesting, too, um, because, you know, everybody likes to blame Jim uh, f for infecting me, but I honestly don't believe that it was Jim because uh, my uh, previous lover, um, uh, Kevin Perry, uh, who is an artist. We were together for four years, and, um, and I went to his memorial. And so it was before we knew about safe sex. So um, I don't think pe people like to point at Jim, but I really don't think that it was him. And also, it really doesn't matter you know? He was trying to discredit you to make you look like you were, you had done something stupid. You know? Yeah. You didn't do anything stupid, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, uh, uh, yeah, the accusation was that, you know, how, how can, you know, somebody, uh, you know, um, be irresponsible or, 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 or whatever. Um, but you know what, accidents happen. And, um, and also, you know, I'll share with you as well. I mean, I'm, uh, I've been sober eight years. Yes. So I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm very good friends with Bill W. Uh, <laughs> So uh, it's, um, you know, a, a lot of things happen. You know, accidents happen, stuff happens. Um, it was interesting because I, I, I got this note, this email, and it was really cryptic. And I wasn't sure who, the, who sent it and where it was going to. Um, it, it was kind of untraceable. And so I took a chance and I answered it. And I said, if you need to talk to someone, because it sounded rather distressful. Um, as it turned out, it was a young man who is, you know, in the entertainment industry, um, and uh, he zero converted. And so um, he was reaching out to me, and then I, you know, we conversed back and forth, and he was going to his doctor's appointment to talk about treatment op options. And I said, what time is your doctor's appointment? Because he happened to be in LA, and I was in LA at the time. And so I said, okay, I'll meet you there. 
And so I was there and then I go into his appointment and of course I knew the doctor. He was one of the doctors at the gay games in Chicago. And so, um, you know, he went through the treatment options and, you know, I was diagnosed in 88, so I've been through every treatment option, you know, from AZT, all the D, D4T, DDI, um, went through the protease inhibitors, you know, stuff, uh, all of those things. So I, I was very familiar with the side effects and reactions. So um, after he had his meeting with the doctor, I sat with him for an hour and a half to two hours uh, sharing my experience with the uh, various medications. Um, you know, fortunately, the treatment treatments now are much more tolerable. So now I just take my, my meds in the morning and meds in the evening and go about the business of living. We have a question over here. <laughs> it's from me. Um, what's next? What's next? What's next for you? <laughs> what's next? Uh, well, I'm, I, I'm doing all, you know, a lot more acting. Um, uh, I, I just did a play reading in New York, uh, Spring at the Willowbrook Inn. And it's kind of like same time next year meets Brokeback Mountain. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful story. Um, so we're, we're actually looking for some place to do it in New York. Uh, and... Uh, Look for me June 12th in Entourage the Movie. Um, I also did a little student film called Saber Dance. And uh, it, was, it was so funny because the, uh, the student who, it was his uh, master's thesis. And it was about the composer um, Aram Chimiakin uh, who wrote Saber Dance. Uh, Kachaturian. Kachaturian is his last name. And so I went in to read for the lead, and then uh, I was the casting director's first choice, but the director found an actual Armenian, he's an Armenian, um, to play the role. And then they were, uh, it, it was his, his meeting uh, Salvador Dali. And so the casting director was like going through pictures and all, you know, not sleeping at night, you know, and like for three days. And, and my picture just like dropped out of the pile and said, oh my God, Greg Luganus. And so I, I played Salvador Dali. Um, <laughs> you know, and my agent was like, you know, well, you're not getting paid for this. You know, I said, hey, if it doesn't cost me any money, you know, why not? Because what casting director is going to cast me as a character? So uh, it was a great opportunity to, uh, you know, to play and, uh, and, and do that. And it was, it was so sweet because uh, Ilya, you know, is too young. He didn't know N from Russia. Uh, and so he didn't know who the heck I was. And he came to the Outfest and saw the movie. And he was just dumbfounded. He said, I just thought you were an actor. <laughs> Greg, I want to thank you so much again for, I think many of us in this room just witnessed such incredible magical moments back in 84 and 88. I want to thank you so very, very much for that. That brought back a lot for many of us. And uh, I want to know if you're going to be involved with the Olympics in 2016. Am, am I? Can you mentor in the Olympics next year? Um, I, you know, I'm you still uh, acting as athlete mentor. Um, they've cut the budget a little bit, so <laughs> tighten the purse, purse strings. So um, I'm not going to be able to, um, you know, to make as many visits. Um, uh, last year, uh, I was only able to make one appearance. They were late in getting me my contract, and by the time they got my contract up, then uh, it was, you know, the year was halfway over and my calendar was filled, so uh, I had trouble making that. But I was at the training camp in, um, they had a training camp in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and so it was there. Um, not the most ideal uh, atmosphere to, to do mentoring, um, because some of the athletes, it was to choose synchro teams to help 
them choose synchro teams. And uh, so it was a little competitive. Some of the athletes didn't have their coaches. But uh, I was just in uh, North Carolina. And I was supposed to be there for the, um, the Athletes Advisory Council meeting representing the United States Olympian and Paralympian Association, which I'm one of the VPs on. And so I was standing in for another member who couldn't attend the, uh, the meeting. And it was in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I called Steve Foley and I said, you know what? You know, USOC is paying my way to North Carolina. Why don't I go to Raleigh? You know, go to Duke uh, because we have a young athlete there. Well, actually, we have two. Um, uh, Abby Johnson, who I, I've worked with before, and she's continuing to dive. And then we have a young talent, Jordan Wendell, who I've seen since he was eight. And he has an amazing story. And um, it was funny because when I first met him, he, when he was eight years old, my coach's son, Tim O'Brien, was coaching him. And he said, Craig, come here. And I was like, look at this kid. And so I watched him. And, you know, I'm used to that. I'm like, you know, because everybody expects, you know, oh, he reminds me of me. You know, and, and I was watching this kid. And it was like, oh, my God. This is the real thing. Yeah, he reminds me of me. And so then I went back there. And he had a different coach. And um, he has two fathers. He's uh, adopted from Cambodia. Uh, his father served in the military and um, adopted him. And so, uh, you know, I got to be friends with his, his fathers. And uh, when I saw him when he was 12 with this other coach who actually was an old ex-teammate of mine. And so... Um, I saw so much talent going to waste. I said, you've got to get this kid to the National Training Center, uh, to his dad's. And so I worked it out that he got to the National Training Center. And within one year, um, when he first got there, he could barely do a lineup on 10-meter platform. And then after, uh, within the year, he had learned a front three and a half pike, back three and a half, reverse three and a half, inward three and a half, back two and a half with one and a half twists, and an arm stand twister. So it was com a competitive senior list within one year. Um, he's now 16, so he'll be 17 next year. And uh, I actually told his, his coach, Nunzio, I said, don't rule out 2016. You know, he, there's definitely a possibility he could do it. So... Um, you know, and he's a great kid. And it was so funny because, like, when he was eight years old, he he was had he was drawing. He's he's artistic, um, loves to draw. And um, when he was eight years old, he was drawing. And then he looks up over at me. And of course, his you know favorite meal is sushi. So we were at a sushi bar. You know, it was a sushi place. And so um, you know, he's he's coloring. And he turns to me and he said, "Well." What do you do when they when the kids talk smack about you? And I'm like, talk smack about you? I, you know, I, I didn't quite understand. And then he he said, well, you know, when they talk, you know, badly about you. I said, you know what? I take that as a compliment because obviously they feel threatened by me, and they, you know, if they think of me as a threat, they think of me as their competition. So I think that's very flattering. And so he goes, oh, okay. Um, and you know, he's really been able to practice some of the some of the things that I work with um, as far as mentoring. Uh, his biggest concern now is he said, well, when I, when I do interviews, I, I I do I say a lot of ums. And I said, well, just take a breath. And then I started thinking about it, and I uh, I, I actually called his dad afterwards. I said, you know what? Enroll him in a comedy improv class. Because this way, I mean, you could practice thinking on your feet and having fun and, you know, being funny and not be so self-conscious, you know. So, um, yeah, so I, you know, there's a lot of things that, that I bring that, uh, to the table that a lot of the coaches don't think about, you know, and really think about, 
speaking their language. Um, there's, uh, that's the next book that I'm working on right now, is my journey in learning. Because I also did a one-man show in New York, which was a lot of dialogue. And I was having difficulty getting off, off book, and my director was yelling and screaming at me uh, to get off book. And so then what I learned was I would read the script into a recorder and listen to the, the recording. And then I, as, as an actor, you're a storyteller. So then I could imagine the stories that I was telling. And um, I didn't think about this, but uh, you know, each character is 14 different characters. It was Dan Butler's uh, one man show, the only thing where she could have told me. And so each character had a different color to me. You know, and I didn't know if it was based on the emotional state or if it was the cadence, or I didn't judge it. It just was. Well, the second night with the audience, I went up in the second scene. And I turned to the audience and I said, I'm sorry, I'm lost. And I started walking around the stage and I'm thinking, okay, the script's backstage, but I can't leave. I'm the only actor out here. I, I know that it's a small production, you know, in a uh, small theater. There's uh, the stage manager's working lights. And so I can't call line, you know, and then, and then I thought of the color. And that brought me back. And I shared that with a friend of mine who was a sports psychologist and then he went to Juilliard, started working with um, artists who've had similar experiences but never got back on the stage. And when I shared that story with them, he said, oh, that makes perfect sense. Because when you're thinking logically where the script is, you know, the manager being working lights, you know, that's very right brain, it's very logical. And then when you thought of the color, then it brought you back to your left brain, uh, no, right brain, right brain, creative side, um, to, uh, you know, and that's where performance lies. And so, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm writing about that and exploring that and exploring all of the different uh, ways that I've learned, uh, you know, to succeed, to try to succeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You know, you've been a, a big hero to me personally and to many people here as, as an American and the, as an athlete during the Olympics and then as a gay man who you're coming out and your confession of HIV. I want you to think outside of the box a little bit. I'm going to raise the stakes. If you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? If I was a superhero, what, my, what would my superpower be? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I'd love to fly. Um, I, you know, yeah, uh, kinda. It's more like falling. <laughs> falling very fast and hitting the water really hard. Um, but, um, you know what, I, you know, I, I think it would be the power of teleportation. Because then I can be anywhere at any time. Um, you know, because one place my mind is, is I, I have a friend who had a stroke, and I'd like, you know, um, so my, my prayers are with him and his partner. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's those moments in time that, you know, you want to be there for someone. Thank you, Greg. Uh, this has been amazing, to say the least. But a quick question to take you back when you were living with Dr. Samuel Lee. Was yeah. your family supportive of you? and your athletic endeavors, because obviously, I believe you were not out at that time. Um, no, I, I wasn't out at that time. I mean, I was also only 16. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, and, and a lot of times, I mean, when you're young, you don't put sexual identity to it. You know, you just feel different. Um, my parents were always supportive. Um, my dad especially. 
got very interested once I started into diving. Um, I took care of my dad the last six weeks of his life. He, he passed in, in uh, 1991. And I took care of him the last six weeks of his life. And actually the last year of his life, uh, he was diagnosed with cancer. And then it became a crusade for life and quality of life. And we'd had many important conversations about that. And, uh, and, and we talked about, about that. Um, because I thought he disapproved of my dance and acrobatics because I thought he felt what the, what the kids were saying about me, that, oh, it's a, it's a sissy thing to do, um, faggot, all that stuff. Um, and I felt that my father felt the same way. Little did I know, when I had my per first performance on stage when I was three years old, I didn't think he was there. But he was working. And he came in specifically for my performance and saw me from the back of the room and watched my performance. Um, so that was the first time that I learned about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, it was... He also didn't have parents. Um, he was raised by his grandmother. Uh, his, di his parents died when he was quite young. So he didn't really have um, a lot of tools. Uh, and he did the best he could. And, um, you know, and it was interesting because I, I, I just spoke at World Wisdom Days uh, on Sunday. And it's all about my meditation uh, and finding forgiveness and the process and learning about oneself um, and getting to that place of forgiveness and letting go of the labels and about living, uh, not living your story, but living your life. And um, it was, you know, it really has been a journey through that and I learned so much in, in the care of my, taking care of my dad the last six weeks of his life. Initially I did it because I wanted to be the good son. I wanted that label. And then in time, uh, I realized I did it out of love. That I actually loved this man. And he loved me. Because he spoke the truest words that he ever spoke to me. He said that I was doing something for him that he knows that he never could have done for me. You know, and it made me a little sad, but it made me a little proud too. You know, but it was honest and it was truth. Hi. Uh, first of all, I, w I would like to personally applaud you and uh, like everyone else and just say uh, I think my friend said it best right now when the other gentleman asked you know who would be your fi your superhero I think you alone are a superhero <laughs> of you, your life journey has just been you know uh, a beautiful journey um, I want to applaud you because number one someone like you has definitely paved the way for someone like me who can confidently self-identify as a gay male um, and without shame acknowledge that I am too HIV positive so, and living my life in a healthy way. Um, with all your accolades, um, being a multi-Olympic you know, Olympic gold medalist and uh, your, your journey um, being an advocate for the LGBTQ community and a voice for HIV AIDS awareness. What would you say or consider is your greatest accomplishment out of all those and it, or a culmination of them? Um, greatest accomplishment. Um, you know, I'd really like to sit down with Putin, you know, <laughs> and, and just, you know, just get, to, you know, let him get to know me. You know, so that he realizes, I mean, there's nothing to fear here. Hello? You know, we're all human beings. Um, you know, and deserve dignity. Uh, 
and have every right to, you know, to be who we are. You know, whether it's LGBT, whether it's, um, I, I also served on a panel uh, not too long ago for, it was Human Rights First in DC. And on that panel was Eli Wolf and um, uh, Sharia Ahmad. Um, Eli, uh, he also serves on the board of the United States Olympian and Paralympian Association. So um, he, he's a Paralympian. And then um, uh, Shari Ahmad uh, is a Pakistani soccer player, uh, plays for Canada, uh, Team Canada. But, um, you know, and she's very active, you know. And um, the one thing that is, I found very important, uh, because I, you know, I also did a play in Chicago, uh, Just Say No. Larry Kramer called me up. Larry Kramer calls you up and asks you to do his play, you do his play. So um, he asked me to play Junior, and, um, and so I said, sure, you know, I'll do your play. And then they said, oh, we're going to have a photo shoot. And I said, okay, uh, to promote the, uh, you know, the play, this little play in Chicago. And so then somebody says, oh, there, this is uh, going to be on the cover of, I can't remember if it was Advocate or Out. And um, I said, on the cover? Why would it be on the cover? And I'm thinking, oh my god, the, the Nancy Reagan character must be like some bull dyke or something. You know? And, and everybody's like, have you met Alexandra? Have you met Alexandra? I'm like, no, I haven't met Alexandra yet. And then I met Alexandra, and she's this incredible transgender uh, person. And um, it was funny because we, you know, Larry, Larry and I had, you know, ha had a lot of fun with her. You know, she's very open about her um, her addiction, and um, and also that she's married, and she's married to a woman. And of course, Larry is like, okay, wait, wait a minute. You, you know, you were with men before, and then you had the sex change, and then you got a sex change to be a lesbian, you know, and it's like, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it was amazing. And um, to see Transcendent, you know, that she's a part of, uh, do so well uh, and get recognized at the Golden Globes was really, really gratifying. You know, because I'm a gay man. I'm not a lesbian. I'm not a transgender, I'm not bi, so, you know, who am I to, you know, to speak on that, you know, and we're supposed to be a community. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, we just, we all, whether it be uh, a disability, anything, any difference, you know, we should embrace each other's differences. One more question. Hi, Greg. Hi. Oh, there you are. Hi. So in 1988, I'm lying on my living room floor watching you compete in Seoul. Uh -huh. And when you performed that reverse three and a half, I went up and my hand shot up in the air and was screaming yes, and my parents came in, what, what is wrong, what was wrong with you? But I knew that you did it. Yeah. Uh, great moment for me as a young athlete, watching you compete. Shortly you. after that, you decided to retire. Yeah. Could you talk about the decision process and uh, what you went through in inner, tur inner turmoil to decide to retire? Well, um, the timeline of that, uh, you know, I was diagnosed six months prior to the Olympic Games being HIV positive. I didn't know, I, when I was diagnosed, I, I had barely 200 T cells. I mean, it, it was 212 T cells, I think. Um, and so, uh, you, know, I, you know, I knew that that was an issue because at that time, I mean, HIV AIDS was a death sentence. 
and so I, you know, didn't think I'd be around that long. And then um, I, I was also rather entrenched in, uh, I mean, I had to wait until Jim left the house because he kept the cabinets locked, um, the filing cabinets locked to do some investigation, you know, to find that, you know, I only had $2,000 to my name and everything else was held in his name. Uh, and so, you know, I, I was in the midst of that, you know, trying to extricate myself from that. Um, left the house um, and was trying to get back into the house. And I asked my attorney, I said, how long is this gonna take? And she said, normally it takes about five years. So I said, you know what, I have to get on with my life. So, um, and I wanted a dog, and I wanted a Great Dane. And so uh, I got myself a little house in, in Venice and went on with my life. You know, I did Cinderella at Long Beach Civic Light Opera. Um, you know, I did a lot of things. Uh, you know, I, I was friends with Rosie O'Donnell and so, you know, sometimes we'd hang out together because um, she was going through, you know, some similar situation at the time. And so we would, be, we, you know, we'd commiserate together. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there was a lot of things going on at that time. Um, I think I, re I retired at the right time. I think it was the right thing to do. I mean, I did have second thoughts uh, in 1990 I was commentating, and I was playing around on the boards, and they said, oh my God, you can win nationals. And you know what, that was probably true, and flattery is very seductive. Um, you can be seduced by, you know, by flattery, and, um, and it was very flattering for them to say, oh, you could win nationals. Uh, and so I did talk it over with Ron. I said, what do you think about me coming back? And he said, okay, you know, what it would take. And he said, you know, yeah, you can win nationals, but can you repeat your gold medal performances? Because you know the sacrifices that, you know, that you're gonna have to make and the extra work that you're gonna have to put in to compete with the Chinese. And he said, your heart really has to be in it. And he said, you have to be be true to yourself and be honest with yourself. Is your heart in it? And my response was, no. You know, I, I was doing it out of lack of anything else, else better to do. And so I, I didn't make a comeback. Uh, and I, th I think I did the right thing. Um, have something, something to. You know, and, and that whole experience, you know, when you retire from your sport, you know, it's almost like you've, you know, you've dedicated your life to it, and then you lose a part of yourself. You lose your identity, you know, because then, I mean, it's like when she asked me, well, who's Greg Luganis? I, I don't know, you know, yeah, really. Um, but I also realized that I have so many other gifts uh, my acting, my dog training. Uh, I have other things that I can do uh, um, and that I, that I love, that I enjoy, and that I have passion for.